So good morning, good evening, good late night, depending on where you're dialing in from in this world. Today we're going to talk about can you really get prevention from Medicare? And the answer is, well, that depends. It depends on how you define prevention. Uh, it depends on how patient you are. It depends on uh, your providers. So we're going to not get too deep into that part, but we're going to get a little bit more technical today in terms of just what does uh, Medicare look at. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll obviously have our Q&A and several other things, which we always do. Now, before we get into that, if you've not been on our channel before, you may not realize what we do. What we're about is helping people understand and prevent the things that are most likely to kill them or disable them. And whether it's heart attack, stroke, um, dementia, or some other things, all of them tend to have, tend to focus around one uh, risk factor that's just not that well understood. Cardiovascular inflammation, which for the most part, I mean, it happens with some other inflammatory, uh, cardiovascular inflammation happens with some other inflammatory things like rheumatoid arthritis, um, lupus arthritis, um, psoriatic arthritis, but the vast majority of unrecognized heart attack and stroke and dementia risk boils down to one thing that's just not diagnosed very well, no matter which medical community you're talking to, and that's prediabetes, insulin resistance, diabetes, which is all the same metabolic syndrome, which is all the same disease, by the way. The only difference between prediabetes or, quote, a touch of sugar, end quote, and diabetes that's killing you is a few uh, gradations of numbers. And I think we're going to end up finding, it's certainly my position, that the science would indicate, the evidence would indicate more people are dying from mild or pre-diabetes than die from diabetes. Why is that? Because the doctors that we depend on to diagnose and manage it don't know how to do it. Um, that is also, that's not an opinion, that's just evidence, that's a fact. So I'm going to need to move back out so I can see. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> so if you could keep that open that way so we can look at the, the slides as well, Aspen. Um, <clears throat> so those of you who haven't been on the channel before realize that there's a lot to understanding uh, the things that, that kill us these days. Um, it used to be what they called a developed world. Back in the you know 20 and 30 years ago, you used to say there were rich parts of the world and there were poor parts of the world. And the developed world was the U.S., uh, Japan, um, the BRIC countries, Brazil, uh, India, China, were not really included in those. But uh, there's been huge development over the past 30 years. And as uh, there's been that level of economic development, food is not the big issue that it used to be, at least in those countries. It still is in, in a lot of countries, and especially in some of the war-torn and, uh, and African countries. But as food scarcity becomes less of an issue, um, Prediabetes, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, heart attack, stroke, and uh, dementia all become bigger and bigger issues. So <clears throat> those are some of the things that you have to start learning yourself, because if your doctor doesn't know how to diagnose it, then you need to know a little bit. Now, again, there, it's not that difficult. We'll talk a few minutes about in a few minutes about some resources on how to do that. Um, <clears throat> here's some of the topics that we've covered recently: meat and heart disease. Should you go vegan? You know, we've got a lot of folks on a couple of our outlets, like uh, um, 
some of the newer outlets uh, like locals that uh, really got into a lot of hating on that title. The bottom line is you don't have to go vegan. Uh, going vegan is not going to assure uh, that you have problems either. You know, it really depends on how you manage your diet and how you manage uh, macronutrients is a big, big deal because prediabetes and diabetes and insulin resistance are such a big, big deal. Um, dairy fat and the myth behind dairy fat was one of our topics. Um, aspirin for secondary prevention. These were all topics that we've covered recently. So in terms of looking at core topics, you really can learn a lot more about how to protect your health than your doctor knows 95, 98% of the time in just a few hours. Uh, that's the purpose of our basic core curriculum. These online courses, uh, we're, we've been back and forth on how to offer these courses. They've been very popular. They're by far our most, um, our most uh, acquired, purchased uh, item. We've gone from giving them uh, for from selling them for like 50 bucks to down to 19 bucks to giving them away for free for some things. And uh, just check in with uh, with Michelle if if you have an interest or go to our website. You'll find it on the website itself. But again, with, within about two hours, you can learn more about insulin resistance than 98 percent of doctors know cardiovascular inflammation, then you can learn more about that than most doctors know. Cardiovascular plaque, how do you really evaluate that? You know, Tim Russert was, a, was the poster boy towards, uh, if you have a, um, a normal or uh, non-disease indicating um, Stress tests, does that mean that you're really good to go? You're healthy and you're not going to have a heart attack? The answer is obviously no. He died within just a few months after having a negative stress test. And so the, the, answer, the, the question is, well, then why do we do those? And what are better ways of dealing with this? So <clears throat> you can find all of that on these courses. And again, you can learn how to protect your health. So within just a few hours, you can learn how to protect your health for decades. Think about it. As I mentioned, we've got some, uh, some newer media outlets, Locals and Rumble. Uh, some folks don't like Facebook and YouTube. YouTube is our home. It's where we um, started. It's where we have provided most of our information. Uh, YouTube has, uh, has been good to us. Um, and they've, it's been good to our population. We're now over 120,000 uh, subscribers. It's all over the world. Uh, for example, our number five country for uploads for our information is uh, China. So we, we've got patients all over Asia. Um, there's a lot of people interested in saving their life and protecting their health. <clears throat> We'll talk about subscription plans later as we get deeper into the Medicare program. For those of us in the United States who are eligible for Medicare, we are working on a Medicare program. And um, the goal is for, to provide better access. You know, it's hard to think about paying 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 bucks to see a doctor, uh, even if you know that he or she can give you better prevention uh, when you can just go down the road and see somebody for a copay. We've known that from day one. Um, the other big challenge for uh, patients has been, oh, I'd love to see you, doc. I wish you were in my area. And I just don't know how to do um, telemedicine. Well, I've, been, I've had a, a, an interest in telemedicine back when I was uh, helping run uh, Premise, on-site health care, then actually uh, left Premise to go run uh, MD Live, one of the 
the top two uh, remote medicine, telemedicine uh, companies. It was great. Um, it did provide that access. But at that time, it was before COVID, before the shutdown. And it was all basically just, and it still is, mostly just um, urgent care. I still work with MD Live. I work with others as well, like K-Health, in terms of helping them set up their programs. Um, all of them are trying to get into chronic disease care. Well, that's where I am with this little uh, practice that we run uh, internally. And um, now, again, we're able, given some of the things that we learned when we set up a program in Alabama, we're now able to help uh, folks get better access by accepting Medicare. We're going to talk a little bit more about the details on what we're accepting with Medicare. Um, but before we do, um, a couple of questions about you know, folks have said, oh, I think you're great. I still want to see my doctor. Why don't you set up a way to train my doctor on how you do prevention? Well, we heard you. We listened. And we've done just that. Um, it, there's, a, there's a channel called uh, Physicians Network, PrevMed Health. Uh, that is our channel set up specifically to help train your doctors. You know, I've been in the business of training doctors in prevention for many, many years. Since Medicare has started to make some of its uh, payment changes into prevention or fee for value, uh, I've been the chief science officer for a large company uh, in Florida called Physician Partners. I started uh, my own program in Alabama, um, recently took on Physician Partners as a majority investor. So that is a major part of my passion now, helping train other doctors in how to make their practice grow and thrive in doing prevention and even accepting Medicare to do it. You can do it. They can do it. It can be done. It works. But you just got to know what you're doing. And if you want your doc to, uh, to start thinking about that, uh, see if you can get your doc to take a look at our channel in that space. Just another quick reminder, Ozempic, uh, the two, there are two, we manage a lot of prediabetes and diabetes. The vast majority of what we do is lifestyle. And um, there are a couple of drug uh, categories that have come out that are just so much better. They're safer than, um, than insulin in many ways, both short-term and chronically. Uh, these drugs don't have uh, hypoglycemia uh, risk that insulin has, and they don't impact your body with cardiovascular inflammation like, um, like uh, insulin does. Now, many people would say, well, doc, you're talking about drugs a lot. You're always talking about lifestyle. Lifestyle is still the king. Uh, I mean, you, you look at, I, I can't tell you the number of people that have come to see me that were already on uh, the GLP-1s or the SGLT-2s that had not lost weight and were still struggling with their diabetes. So these drugs, although they're far better than anything we've had before, still, uh, Still, lifestyle is king, and it always will be. You can't just take a drug and eat everything you want and expect to be healthy. You just can't do that unless you have some interesting um, genetic-related uh, diseases like Marfan's and some of the sticklers, some of the uh, connective tissue diseases will keep you thin, but they bring their own risk-related issues. You know, you you. You can, quote, eat anything you want because you don't want as much to eat as the typical uh, rest of us humans that we like to eat. So anyhow, <clears throat> it's also not a surprise that the most effective uh, drugs, the most effective and safest drugs we've had for diabetes also are the most effective and uh, safe drugs for weight loss. Ozempic. You, you've heard of it a thousand times. Uh, and every time you've heard of it, uh, wealthy people have heard of it too. And they've been lapping it up 
to uh, use it for weight loss. Um, why the linkage between weight loss and diabetes? Well, there's no question. Age is it? Age may be a stronger risk factor for diabetes, and it is. Genetics, maybe, maybe not, but clearly in the top three risk factors for diabetes is body fat, excess body fat. We used to think that uh, body fat was a, uh, an inert energy storage tissue. It's not inert. It is in energy storage, but it releases things called cytokines, adipokines, some other things that cause us to have insulin resistance. And it's a vicious spiral. So as we get older, we really, need, it becomes more and more critical for our health to watch exactly how much weight we put on. That comes right in the face of the middle age bulge. You know, we tend to think of middle age bulge happening because, well, we're working more, we're spending more time seated at a desk, which, you know, sitting is like the new smoking anyway. You may have noticed I always stand at my desk. Um, but it's not really. It, it, the question is, um, what causes the middle age spread? Is that hormonal? Is it because we're losing, males are losing testosterone and females are losing uh, estrogens? Maybe, but not really the big issue. There is a major hormonal issue. It's not just behavior. Uh, we, you read books like Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It by Gary Taubes. Uh, it's a great book. Uh, it's, you know, three to 700 pages, depending on which book you read, that or Good Calories, Bad Calories. But the concept is very simple. It's not that we're getting fat because we're eating more. It's that we're eating more because we're getting fat. Now, why does that happen? Because we're becoming insulin resistant. And as I said, uh, age, body fat, and genetics are all the biggest issues, the biggest risk factors for this problem. And as I also said, it's a spiral. Every five pounds you gain makes you more insulin resistant. Every increase in insulin resistance, the harder it is for you to lose weight. Now, why is it that it's hard for you to lose weight if you're insulin resistant? Well, if you're insulin resistant, you crank resistant, you have to crank up more and more insulin. What happens when you get increased insulin? One of the things that insulin does that most people don't realize is that it decreases the ability, the body's ability to burn fat. Once you get into biology uh, and physiology, it makes sense. I'm not going to go down that bunny hole right now. But the bottom line is, the more weight you gain, the harder it is to lose it. Anyhow, I have gone down several bunny holes. Let me go back to the uh, the topic, and that is we need to just, we have so much demand now for uh, the GLP ones. Ozempic is the classic GLP one. It's the one that's most well known. And the bottom line is it's the one that's very, very difficult to get. So <clears throat> uh, we have a lot of patients on GLP ones, a lot of patients on Ozempic. We have a lot of patients that can't get them. So that's what the remi this reminder is all about. What do we do? We ask you to check in with your pharmacist, see which pharmacist uh, or see which uh, GLP ones your pharmacist has available. Uh, alter alternatives that we've seen a lot of are Trulicity, Victoza, um, and most of all, uh, the new one, Mongero. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> Genuvia, Trulicity, Wegovi, all of these are very similar. And in fact, um, Ozempic and Wegovi are the exact same drug. They're just in different um, uh, dosages and they're, they have different indications. Wegovi is clearly there specifically for weight loss. Mongero is, we, we covered that recently 
it's uh, it appears to be more effective than the twin critins or glip ones. I mean, the incretins, it's actually called a twin critin. Where does that come from? Uh, the incretins, uh, like glucagon, GLP-1, stands for glucagon like peptide. These are hormones that are actually developed uh, and, and put out by the intestines. What they do is they tell your, your body, get ready, we're getting ready to put some food into the bloodstream. So the pancreas needs to get ready to, um, to uh, put out some insulin. So it needs to increase availability of insulin. <clears throat> and the stomach needs to stop dumping more food into the intestine. Uh, <clears throat> Mongero, uh, as we covered, I guess six months, maybe a year ago, uh, has two different types of incretin uh, models in it. And uh, as such, it does appear to be significantly more uh, powerful than your typical GLP-1. Now, <clears throat> that may sound good, but remember, you have uh, side effects with any kind of medication. Uh, nausea vomiting, uh, stomach, e even vomiting, e uh, occasional diarrhea. Those things can happen with this. Uh, there are other things as well. So <clears throat> these are prescription medications. The reason medications are typically prescription is they have significant side effects. So again, if you're uh, struggling to get uh, access to Ozempic, there are other drugs. We've not uh, been able, we've not found anybody that we could not get anything for. Now, I said we were going to talk a little bit more about some of the technical issues of, uh, associated with, um, with Medicare. <clears throat> we're going to have a brief discussion about PAR versus non-PAR. A participating provider. So why are we going into that? And it, is that dry and dull? Well, <clears throat> it is an issue, especially for groups like us who are stepping into to providing uh, Medicare uh, to folks. So if you're looking at getting uh, better access to groups like us and using Medicare, this is one of the things you need to have at least some, um, some knowledge of. Participating basically at the, at, at the bottom line refers to a provider who's voluntarily and in advance entering into a contract with uh, Medicare to accept Medicare payment in full. A non-participating provider, there are a couple of different types. One just says we don't participate at all. Uh, you, you voluntarily sign out of Medicare provision. And that's what we had done for the first few years of our practice. Um, a non-participating provider can and does um, bill the patient, but they are limited to the um, the amount that Medicare costs. Again, this is for that group that's sort of in between that says uh, we're a Medicare provider, but we're non-PAR. The bottom line is, I realize that's confusing. I'm not going to go too deep into it. I will just make one clarification for those that are interested in what we're doing. We are going into full participation. Um, there's some other components. Um, we've had patients, for example, say, well, you know, Medicare doesn't pay for um, cardiovascular inflammation panels. I would like to have that. Is that possible? And the answer is yes. You just have to um, uh, sign a form that says, I know that Medicare is not, um, not paying for uh, full cardiovascular inflammation panels, or maybe they're not paying for a, um, a uh, fractionation a lipid cholesterol or cholesterol fractionation. And I'd, I'd like to get that because I, I agree and think that it's very important. Again, you can get those, you can access th those through groups like this, but us like, but you just need to know how to access it. If we get further questions on PAR versus non-PAR and some of the details about how to access uh, the payment side of how to access prevention through Medicare, uh, we'll get deeper into that. And if we don't get a lot of questions, we won't cover that. So thank you for listening to that. Next, we're going to go into 
Okay, just what does, how does Medicare pay for prevention and what can you get in terms of prevention if you want to do it through Medicare? As soon as Aspen's uh, co-piloting today and as soon as he gives us the water ball, we'll get into that. So if you start thinking about prevention and the, the key components of prevention through uh, Medicare, it gets confusing. First, you get into the, the annual wellness visits, and there are actually three types, the AWV, which is a subsequent AWV, and then there's um, initial AWV, which is not really initial. The initial is the welcome to Medicare exam. So <clears throat> don't say, if this sounds a little bit confusing, don't say that I didn't warn you. What I will do, though, is continue to back up to 30,000 feet and make you aware of some of the key things that you need to be aware of. Your, your doc uh, needs to be aware of some, some more of the details between the, you know, distinguishing uh, distinctions between the three, but you don't need to. You just need to be aware of a few things. So that initial uh, preventive physical exam is not really a physical exam. None of these are physical exams. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, it, the IPPE is also called the Welcome to Medicare visit. It reviews medical and social health history and preventive services education. Now you think that's boring. It talks about, do I have a living will? Do uh, what is my mental status? Uh, how about my activities of daily living? What are my medications? Do I know how to do, you know, what is my prevention plan for each of my diseases? Do I have uh, uh, diabetes and prediabetes? That last question is where it gets into skill. And when I was the chief science officer, for example, for uh, physician partners, that was one of my major roles is teaching the doctors there the skill set to be able to diagnose what they usually were, you know, what they were quite often missing. You know, your typical doc would come into fee for value, Medicare Advantage, having lived in the fee for service world where you just bring the patient in, tap them on the back. Uh, try to act friendly and then write a script so you can get out and write a script for the next patient and the next and the next. And that really does not help the patient's health. It's interesting to get back to the welcome to Medicare exam. It's interesting that a it's, you know, you can, many people call it a physical exam. It's not a physical exam. Medicare does not pay for any preventive physical exams. It pays for preventive meetings. Which brings up the point, you know, so many people think that, well, how can you do the prevention? How can you do medicine uh, on um, remote means, telemedicine? Well, again, look at Medicare. None of their, uh, none of their activities or uh, none of their preventive activities are uh, physical examination based because Prevention is much more knowledge based. You see it in Medicare. You see it with what we do. And again, it's all about uh, the quote from, from Sir William Osler. He was, he was the head of uh, medicine at Johns Hopkins. And he had a young doctor presenting a patient or interviewing a patient. And uh, Osler was none to be impatient uh, with his doctors. He interrupted at one point. The, doc, the young doctor was struggling with the patient in the uh, oak-lined amphitheater, and Osler slammed, interrupted, slammed his hand on, on the counter and said, Doc, if you just listen to the patient, he's telling you his diagnosis. That's so, so true. It's so much even more true in this age of laboratory testing, 
and imaging. Again, neither of which are included in a preventive exam, whether it's the initial preventive exam, the welcome to Medicare exam, or the subsequent Medicare exam. So when does, so what are some of the things that you'll see about a welcome to Medicare exam? It's the first 12 months of Medicare. If you don't have one of those at that point in time, uh, you're no longer eligible. Uh, and again, these are all set up to help you think about some things that you're probably not thinking about in terms of your prevent your overall preventive plan and to help your, your, your doctor, your medical team, think about those as well. Now, all of these, there is no copay. You don't pay anything. And that's a very smart thing. Uh, Medicare is really clear. You know, they make it, one thing that they are good about is watching to see what decreases their healthcare costs, like things like CCM, chronic care management, Things like the annual wellness visit, coming up with a preventive plan for dealing with your health challenges. First of all, assessing your health challenges, ruling some basic ones out, some, some challenges that tend to be forgotten, and coming up with a plan with your medical provider team. So what are the, some of the things that are included in here that we tend to some of which we forget about, some of which we don't. Well, review of medical and social history, you'll get that with um, any, most, almost any provider. Um, most of them are going to forget to talk about depression. Depression is very common. It gets more and more common as we get into our 60s and 70s. And it also tends to be neglected who wants to take their, who wants to get up, go out and work out if they're depressed or anxious? Who wants to man, who, who can muster the discipline to manage their diet if they're struggling with major depression? So again, depression and mental, mental health issues are incredibly important. They're incredibly prevalent and they're incredibly neglected. So this is one of those areas where I said, yeah, it may be boring. Yeah, it may be something you don't want to deal with you know, and your provider don't want to deal with. But it's like that old Listerine commercial. You go ahead and do it. Functional ability and safety level. Those are bigger issues as well, especially for folks that are post stroke or folks like some of uh, uh, the 65 year olds parents that are getting into the 80s and 90s. Functional ability becomes an issue. Uh, as we said, exam is not exactly included other than basic vital signs and things like that. End of life planning. We talked about that a minute ago. That's something that not all of us want to neglect, but pretty close to all of us want to ignore. I can tell you personally, I tend to ignore that. Um, <clears throat> at least personally, I'm a guy. You know, I'm a doctor and although I'm into prevention and I focus on my lifestyle, there are things that I put off and one of them is end of life planning. A review of op opioid prescriptions. Opioids are like uh, other mental health issues, very, very prevalent and in increasing in prevalence among um, Medicare age folks. But again, you see your primary care doc, he or she may or may not think about asking about pain. Screening for potential substance abuse, uh, substance use disorders. Same thing. Uh, all of these mental health issues, uh, and, and I'm going to put pain management in a mental health category, pain management, substance use, depression, anxiety. And anxiety is just the twin, uh, the, the twin brother of depression. All of these things are grossly neglected in our populations. Now, <clears throat> we also talk, again, the whole goal is to develop an education and counseling session to understand these risk factors that many of which can be neglected. And some of these are going to require referral. Now, we mentioned the Welcome to Medicare exam. As I said, there's years one, two, and three. Year one is the Welcome to Medicare exam, the IPPW. 
Number two is the IAV, IAWV, the initial annual wellness visit. And then years three and beyond are the subsequent AWV. And uh, if you think that's complicated, welcome to Medicare. Medicare tends to complicate things. The Fed, I, I don't know what it is about the feds, but they just like to complicate things. Now, Jesus skipped straight over to the AWV. And as I said, there's an initial AWV and then subsequent AWV. With all of these annual wellness visits, again, physical exam is not part of it. It is about developing an understanding of the risk factors that you have, including covering things that you and your primary care doc may not want to think about. You may not want to think about and your primary care doc maybe doesn't want to think about it and doesn't often doesn't isn't set up to deal with it. Uh, there is no charge because, again, it is crystal clear that people that go through this process, whether you like it or not, are going to be healthier. And if you're going to be healthier and you're on Medicare, you're going to cost Medicare a lot less money. And that's a major driver for them. Now, what does it include? A lot of the same things, the health risk assessment, medical and family history, which you'll get with most providers, uh, lists of an understanding of current providers, um, detection of cognitive impairment. That, that's actually on both of them. And again, that's one of those things that I have seen very, very few patients come into me. It happens but not very often where a patient comes in and says, I'm beginning to forget stuff and I'm worried about, you know, sometimes I get lost on the way home. What usually happens is a family member brings that kind of information on cognitive impairment. Again, that's a very big deal. It's a classic item to come up on an AWV. So uh, as before, uh, depression and anxiety risk factors, uh, self-care ability, safety level. Um, and again, what, what you should expect from your provider team at the end of all of this is a list of your health risk factors, plus some basic plans, basic recommendations on what to do next. And as we said before, you know, advanced care planning, which is, you know, a living will, uh, opioid prescriptions, substance uh, use disorders, all of those things. Each year, whether you like it or not, you need to check into that. So FAQs, as I've said a couple of times, the AWV, whether it's the IPPE, the IAWV, or the AW, subsequent AWV, any of these AWVs are not routine physical examinations. That's what everybody tends to think. Annual wellness visit, AWV. So that's my annual preventive exam. And therefore, I can't, since it's an exam, I can't get that uh, from telemedicine. It's got to be with my local doc. It's not an exam. It is a, um, it's a mental process. It's knowing what your risk factors are, working through those and making sure that you have a plan for those. And if you think um, that I say that just because I'm a, I'm a uh, remote uh, telemedicine provider, uh, no. I mean, why do you think it's not included in Medicare? There is not enough of the process where doctors take the time and their doctor team takes the time to sit down with the patient, listen and evaluate and ask questions about what are your health behaviors? What are your health risks? And what are you doing about them? And what are the next steps? That's just an incredibly valuable process. Uh, so back to the script, IP, the, uh, a, the initial, the welcome to Medicare, AWV don't include lab tests. They don't include imaging. They don't include a physical exam. They are walk, walking and working through your health plan. So those of you who have worked with us know that we are uh, 
we do extensive lab testing. We do a lot of it um, because we're what we're doing is looking at the metabolic uh, drivers of health. In the beginning, the things that kill us, the chronic diseases. You know, the when when you go to the MD Lives and the and the K Healths and the other um, your typical telemedicine provider, they're again, typically more of a, um, of an urgent care clinic. They're all trying to get into chronic disease care. And here's why. 80% of the healthcare costs are chronic disease care. They're not urgent care. And chronic disease care all happens from a change in your metabolism. Unfortunately, too many docs wait until they see tissue damage before they diagnose something. So, hence that gets back to some of my, you know, since we're, what we do is uh, diagnose chronic diseases before you get that tissue damage, we're looking at metabolic levels of disease. So, if we're looking at metabolic levels, we're doing a lot of labs, and if labs aren't included in the AWV, then what do we do? We do, we end up doing, <clears throat> for most patients, we'll start with an AWV and then we'll get into what's called an ENM uh, evaluation and management. So once you start um, doing a uh, labs, you're into evaluation, uh, a different type of visit. Um, and once you're writing scripts and that sort of thing, you're also into uh, management. So those are ENM type visits. Most of our AWVs are followed by ENM visits, uh, although not all. I'd say 95%. There's no co copay on any of the AWV type services, as we've mentioned before. The IPPE or, or Welcome to Medicare exam is. Uh, Again, perform the first 12 months of your eligibility. Uh, you're eligible for AWV. Um, you know, this gets into some of the technical stuff, some of the technical games that get played by payers. Um, um, most docs don't get to this level of knowledge about AWVs. A lot of them don't even do AWVs at all because that's not what they learned when they first got out of school. Um, Technically, if you if your doc bills a, a regular subsequent AWV, the Humana and the other payers will tend to go ahead and pay that uh, because they pay less than uh, and your doc gets paid less. And that's unfortunate because we want to pay our docs appropriately for doing preventive services. So. If you've got those three, the Welcome to Medicare is, is available in the first year, the initial AWV is available or the second year, and then the third year and beyond is the subsequent AWV. And you want your doctor to do those correctly. There's some slight differences between the three, not huge, but again, these are all things that your doc needs to know. Some things that you need to know too. So uh, if you if you'd like to get us to help your doc, again, refer him or her to, uh, to some of what we covered today, and you should be aware of it as well. As we've mentioned a couple of times, routine physical exam. Are you, doc, wait a minute. Are you sure that there's not a routine physical exam? Because my doc always did one with my AWV. An exam performed without relationship to treatment or diagnosis for a specific illness, sim symptom, complaint, or energy or, or injury. That uh, this is coming right out of the CMS uh, website. So basically, what they're saying is that's a preventive exam, and we CMS Medicare we don't pay for that. Medicare does not cover a routine physical exam. It's prohibited by statute 42 CFR part 411. And again, pardon me if all of that sounds very uh, uh, bureaucratic. You're not going to get Medicare to pay for your health care without learning a little bit about the Medicare bureaucracy. 
So, you know, life comes with a trade-off. If you want to pay a couple of thousand to get this stuff done, you can out of your own pocket, you can pay for that and not have to learn some of this stuff. If you want Medicare to pay for it, you got to learn a little bit. And this is one of the things you got to learn. They don't pay for preventive examinations. They pay for visits, which are, again, something that's a little bit different. It's much more based on uh, a health plan. Now, you can get plenty of uh, evaluation and management, including prescriptions and everything you need, but that's a different type of visit, and it's called e &M, evaluation and management. Uh, so if you do want to get a, a preventive exam from your doctor, you pay for that 100%, unless your doctor's billing inappropriately, and that happens a lot. So we got into some uh, incredibly, for some people, boring details about the CMS bureaucracy. But as I said before, uh, it's a big thing to have Medicare pay for your health care. It's a big advantage. Along with that advantage comes some disadvantage. And some of the disadvantage is you got to learn what you're doing. So, uh, as usual, we have uh, we end up the show with about half of the show being Q and A. I see we've already gotten some start on some Q and A uh, questions for today. So when Aspen gives us the uh, intro, we'll go into that. So let me put my glasses on. Can't see very well without the print without it. Cindy Herbal, Cindy E. Welcome to you, Cindy. Mabuhai, Bobby Ocampo in the Philippines. And I think that's Dipalog. Uh, and it means happy life, good life, or something like that. Sam Mirzakanian. Mirzak Kanian, can creatinine monohydrate intake before and after resistance training raise levels of HSCRP? So for those of you who don't know, HSCRP, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, is one of, the, one of the cardiovascular inflammation panel tests. And in fact, there are very few docs that know or that go into looking at cardiovascular inflammation. Of the ones that do, the vast majority look at C-reactive protein. Of those, most of them know to look at HS, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Um, so you get to an even smaller and smaller and smaller group. I can tell you uh, HS C-reactive protein is the most common biological faults positive, meaning there are a lot of things in biology and medicine that cause faults positive C-reactive proteins. For example, uh, injections like uh, flu vaccine. If you give flu vaccine to 100 people today, 48 to 72 hours from now, two-thirds of them, 66 people, will have a positive false positive C-reactive protein, indicating that they've got cardiovascular inflammation when in fact they don't. So what you need to do is make sure that you know the rest of the story. And for those few doctors that know to look for this, and the majority of which look at uh, HSC, for the few doctors that know to look at inflammation, cardiovascular inflammation, the majority look at HSCRP. They really need to look at other stuff too, like microbiome and creatinine ratio, which tells us how much uh, microproteinuria we have, how much protein we're spilling through the intima into our urine. Uh, LPPLA2, uh, plaque, also called plaque 2 and not to be uh, confused with LP little a. Um, LPPLA2 and MPO, myeloperoxidase, are both actors in this play. They are enzymes released by uh, monocytes, the monocyte uh, cell line, and uh, polymorphs, the other, uh, another uh, immune cell line. 
where our body's actually taking friendly fire. They're seeing plaque. They're no. They're understand. They are understanding plaque should not be there, um, deposited in the artery wall, and um, therefore they're attacking it. Now let me get back to your specific question. So you're looking at HSC reactive protein. You've noticed that the C stands for creatinine. Creatine is a um, is a supplement that's given to get a pump, build muscles. Creatine is, I think, one of the more common amino acids or proteins seen in um, in the muscle. So the assumption is if I take a lot of creatine, I'm going to build big muscles. It'll help me build big muscles. The answer is creatinine and creatine are not exactly the same. They are related. And <clears throat> bottom line is, no, creatine is not supposed to impact this. I've seen uh, evidence which I, I'm comfortable that it doesn't. So great question. Thank you, Sam. Bart Robinson, very good morning to everyone. And a very good morning to you, Bart, as well. Dwight Baldwin. Hi, Dr. Brewer. You've mentioned some B complex brands. I looked them up and some of the B vitamin B levels are very high. Any concerns? So let me go back and provide a little context, Dwight, for other folks. One of the most common times that, uh, that you see discussion of v vitamin B complex is when you're talking about the methylated vitamin B complex. Now, why would you talk about methylated vitamin B complex? Well, it has to do with people that are poor methylators. And <clears throat> it depends on who you listen to. There's some people who, there's a couple of guys that that's all they ever talk about. On the other hand, if you listen to Z Dog MD, he'll say, yeah, methyl poor methylation exists, but it makes absolutely no difference. Well, I don't agree with either group. Um, I do think it makes a difference. And I mean, we've demonstrated that. We've, we've shown um, uh, the pictures of people's eyeballs, their retina, uh, when... Um, when taking some uh, uh, methylated B complex versus not, and you get visible improvement. Now, why would Z Dog not not see any difference? He's a he's a hospitalist. He's you know he's seeing patients two to four weeks at most, and two or three days usually in the ICU. And no, once you're in an ICU and you're in a, your, your time frame for making it through that medical challenge is managed in terms of days, even hours, sometimes weeks. No, uh, methylation is not gonna be a big deal. Now, on the other hand, uh, there's a lot more to life than methylation. Is it real and what is it? Well, <clears throat> um, Methylation, you, you know, it, it gets back to some other really basic things. If we get back up to 50,000 feet, uh, the, still the most common, there, there are multiple mechanisms and theories about aging, like David Sinclair talking recent, more recently about the information theory of aging. And uh, if you have interest in that, go, me going down that bunny hole, ask a question about it. Uh, there are multiple different mechanisms for aging that he discusses, diabetes, uh, he brings up the information theory, which is a very good mechanism. But ever since the 50s and 60s, you've seen the mitochondrial theory of aging. Now, what has that got to do with Dwight's question about vitamin B complex? So what is... What, what are the mitochondria doing? The mitochondria are the furnaces of the cells. They are where we have the fire going on that helps give us 36 A ATP for every six carbon glucose molecule and whatever else, you know, you got three carbon uh, things that get put in there, amino acids get put in there, et cetera, but it's the furnace. Well, 
what does a furnace do? And what, what would engineers or chemists or mechanics call that process? They'd call it oxidation or rust, Com combination, combining with oxygen. How do you put that fire out? Well, with water or uh, with oxidation, you do it with reduction. You know, the chemists would call that reduction. At the end of the day, oxidation is adding oxygen. Uh, reduction is adding um, hydrogen back. Well, the body doesn't exactly do it that way. The body, the human body, doesn't add just a hydrogen. It adds a methyl group. So the, the way to protect us, our cells, from the ravages of aging, you know, I'm 65, so... Uh, I, I doubt that any, I doubt that I've got a significant number of mitochondria that are actually 65 years old, but imagine a 65 year old furnace. It's just going to have holes in it and, you know, with smoke coming out of it and um, burning embers sticking out, et cetera. Well, how do you douse that? How does our body douse that? <clears throat> so that helps you to start understanding the term methylation at least and the, um, the, the methylation is, uh, so here's the next question. What does methylation have to do with vitamin B complexes? So these methyl groups are actually stored in methylated B complex. So the B vitamins do a whole lot of different things. One of those is carrying methyl groups for this process to help us control the, quote, controlled burn associated with oxidation or the my, routine mitochondrial function. So we do need a, a proper methylation. Now let's go back and talk about methylators, that term. It's really clear when you look at genetics, um, that some of us don't methylate as well as others. And there's no, there are three major SNPs or um, nucleotide variations, polymorphisms or variations. In other words, um, genetic variations. I have two of the three. So I actually, my personal, and I know this by the way, because I used to work for one of the, uh, uh, premier human genetics labs in uh, Tennessee. I got my um, information about myself for free because I was working for the lab and I'm a poor methylator. So what should you do if you're a poor methylator? Um, first of all, should you get that genetic test? Well, you can. It's not that easily obtained. And the reality is, I'm not sure that I would, I, I, I don't routinely recommend it. If somebody comes in and they've got um, <clears throat> some variations on labs, which we can talk about later, then what I recommend is they just go ahead and get methylated B complex, just bypass all the testing, bypass a bunch of the other stuff and just get a methylated B complex. Now, all of that was context. <laughs> and again, Dwight, thank you. You, you helped me. Uh, uh, you ask a good question, which helped, uh, helped me get into a, an important scientific topic, especially, again, something that's often beat to death on YouTube and other, other internet means. Now, do you get into significant risk? I mean, as you'll see, Dwight's right. Um, the B levels in some of those B complexes are clearly higher than the um, adult recommendations. Well, what do you call it? The IADR, International Adult Dietary Recommendations. Um, and those same, a lot of those same people that talk about how. Um, Poor methylation is the is the worst thing in life, and fixing your methylation problem is going to cure everything, which I obviously don't don't agree with. 
Uh, but a lot of those same people would say, oh, you take too much of the B vitamins and you're going to have headaches and other other health problems. I do think that those those risks tend to be overblown. Uh, you know, life. <laughs> it was funny. I was talking with another healthcare uh, provider who, like me, had done a stint of his career in um, in toxicology, and and we were talking about people and and their over evaluation of risks in some areas and under under evaluation in others, and. and you know, we were saying, look, uh, a lot of us signed up for life and uh, you may not have made that original choice, but you still make that choice every day. And the bottom line is life does have some risk. The reality is the risks associated with um, uh, hypervitaminosis in the B category tend to be overblown. Uh, one of the most uh, significant one is uh, B3 or niacin. But again, uh, most of what I've heard associated with B-complex vitamins um, and the dosages that you're talking about, Dwight, I tend to accept that risk for somebody who's a poor methylator. If you don't have poor methylation, then you should, you know, you don't need to be talking about that anyway. So Dwight, again, is somebody, so you're, thinking about niacin as well. If you're taking niacin, is it recommended to take trimethylglycine, TMG? Another name for that is betaine. And you also bring up homocysteine. So you brought up the other two issues. So one of the <clears throat> points that we talked about is how do you know without getting full, um, full methylator genetic testing? This is how. Dwight's just told us homocysteine testing. And so I mentioned that I don't rec usually recommend doing full genetic testing. I do that based on homo homocysteine tests. If somebody has significant homocysteine test uh, values, I will usually have this discussion with them. Hopefully I don't take as long as I just did, but sometimes I do. Um, depending on what they say they need in terms of information. And so if somebody has these high homocysteine levels, I would say, just go ahead and, and take these. Um, now, the, you, the third item that you brought up besides TMG, trimethylglycine or betaine and homocysteine is the niacin issue. And I, th I can't remember what the IADR for niacin is, but it's like 60 to 200 milligrams. Um, Cardiologists have used niacin for uh, a long time. And in fact, the standards for cardiology in Europe still recommend using niacin for, it's the only thing that we know of that uh, increases HDL, lowers LDL, uh, in, lowers LP little a. And I can't remember the fourth item, but it's the only thing that we know of that does that. Usually, if you talk to a, a prevention guy and a cardiologist that might know this stuff, they'll say, well, you're not going to get any of those until you get two grams or beyond. That's not true either. I mean, it's because they're not looking at what we talked about earlier. They're not looking at um, inflammation panels. If you look at inflammation panels, you can tell that a lot of people do very well with 250 milligrams of niacin. So number one, <clears throat> you know, it's all about, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is the benefit worth the risk? And there's no question that as you increase niacin, you increase the risk. Uh, niacin can cause uh, liver problems. It's, you know, it's metabolized by the chemical factory in the body, which is the liver. And niacin has killed people. In fact, the two most common and powerful supplements that I use and recommend in my practice are both also the, they're the most powerful, they're the most dangerous as well. Vitamin D3 can wreck your kidneys and kill you. Uh, vitamin B3 or niacin 
can wreck your kidney. I mean, your uh, your liver and kill you. So that's what Dwight's talking about here. Are, are we managing the risk for niacin on the other side? And Dwight, good questions. I appreciate it was very complete. I appreciate what you brought up. And I hope that I gave you what you were looking for. If not, you can let me know a little bit later. J JMK 2921, in attempt to monitor my coronary artery disease, where can I obtain a comprehensive and reliable coronary CT angiogram? Evidently, there's no facility or hospital in my city that can offer such a CCTA. Well, <clears throat> Welcome to my world. Uh, you think you think CIMT has not hit the standards yet? CTA again is going to do very well in the future when you get the technology ironed out, when you get the interpretations of the technology ironed out, when the evidence is really clear on what these things mean. When you get that ironed out, when you get providers that are out there, this is CC, uh, CCTA. Uh, CT angiogram where they put dye in like the wrist and then take uh, pictures of the uh, angiogram in the heart. I, I, in most cases that I've seen it delivered, the providers were not ready for prime time. You can argue that the uh, folks are, that the technology is ready for prime time. Um, Tony Diamandis and Tony Robbins have this big program out. I've had a couple of people tell me, oh, I'm with that program. They're national. They're smart. This is great technology. And I'm all that. Well, <laughs> uh, not quite. Uh, there is an AI component to it, artificial intelligence component. And again, I think that is going to end up being good in the future, but the but the uh, the operative term in the sentence I just said is think. I think that's me predicting. The evidence is not there yet. Uh, it's interesting. You'll see a comment a little bit later from Bobby Ocampo, and I think he's right. JMK twenty nine twenty one. Have a CIMT first. Whether you have a CIMT first or not, just. Uh, consult with us. Let us take a look at what you've got going on. There are better ways of detecting heart attack and stroke risk. Yes, I've done a, a, a ton of those. I get balled up every time I do one of the, the CT angiograms because the providers still, they don't know what they're doing yet either. And they tend to come back and say, well, do you want this? Do you want that? You have to give us this order. On um, things that really are not standard, but it's standard for them. <clears throat> Rick Folia, are you taking a statin? Should you? Oh, if you're taking a statin, should you also take CoQ10? Simple answer is yes. Do I think so? Yes. My understanding is the statin also blocks the CoQ10 pathway. If so, how much CoQ10? So two or three quick caveats, Rick. The first one is I think you should. That's just me as a quote expert, end quote, who works with this stuff and who's reviewed the science would say yes. But the, one of the caveats is the science is really bad in this area. When you think about CoQ10 and what it is and health impacts of that and statin impact, it's not that well uh, documented. Uh, so, you know, when you go to your standard doctor and that puts you on um, on a statin and they don't really say anything about CoQ10 and, and often I don't because, you know, I expect my patients to have spent time with our videos uh, and the, um, again, the evidence is not that clear. The bottom line is, well, it, will it ever be clear? Not in our lifetime, I don't think, because uh, there's just too much of a stretch. It becomes a little bit theoretical and maybe esoteric to try to uh, document an actual health impact from that. So it is what it is. Now, then you said, well, if you take if you're going to take it, how much should you take? Um, 
the typical, the standard is 200 milligrams of CoQ10. Now, a lot, what about, um, oh, dang, I just had a senior moment. I've been having so many senior moments over the past few weeks. Um, ubiquinol. What about ubiquinol? Um, should I take that instead? Because I've read that it's more biologically available. Well, it is more biologically available, but is it two to three times more biologically available? Not really. Is it two or three times more expensive? Yeah. So do I take, do I recommend ubiquinol? No, I've taken it in the past. And then I read the, the evidence behind it. And I'd say, if you're worried about getting enough CoQ10, just take two to three times the amount of CoQ10, 400 or 600. You're not going to get into trouble overdosing on CoQ10. And if you really want to pay the extra money for ubiquinol, go ahead. Do I think it's worth it? No. Good morning from Atlanta. Good morning to you, Rick. Bobby Ocampo, well, we talked about that. That was JMK's question about CT angiogram. Rick Foley, can you have a CT angiogram if you have stents? They interfere with calcium scores, CT the same. Uh, <clears throat> the, the ones that I've done did. Oh, okay. So JMK saying, look, I already had a CIMT, but that test was not adequate since it's only said that plaque no mention of hard, soft versus hard. Um, that's so, that's such a challenge. Then the real question is, did you have an actual CIMT? And if you did, why on earth would they do a CIMT and not tell you that? Uh, JMK, I'm not telling you that's your fault. That is the problem with CIMT, just the lack of standardization. Uh, the standardization for CIMT providers is probably worse than CT angiogram providers. Really good point. And uh, Bobby mentioned that I do have a recommended provider. I've got a couple of them. There's there's uh, one that's been in Atlanta that was a good one. There's um, one in LA that's uh, a pretty good one. And then there's Todd and Cardio Risk, uh, Todd Eldridge. He's appeared on this channel with me a few times. Todd has a um, he has a group that basically just travels so you can get them just about anywhere in the US with Todd's group and yes if you'll show uh, Aspen if you'll show yep telephone number exactly right if you'll call that telephone number they can give you a little bit more um, input on how to find that uh, where'd you get the CIMT cardio risk tells you what type of plaque you have so yep you're Bobby and Rick were, are correct. Bambi. Good morning, Bambi Grage. Good to hear from you. Bart, my recent blood work showed my vitamin B12 levels to be too high. Is that a problem? No. Vitamin B12, just like vitamin K2, not vitamin K1, vitamin K2, vitamin B12, and a few other things do not, you, you can't really overdose on them. Your body will store them. Uh, and in higher levels are not going to cause you a problem. That's the short story. Uh, I've gone down too many bunny holes. If I hadn't, I'd go into a little bit more detail on vitamin B12. Um, road goggles. Could you comment on the link between omega-3s and atrial fib? <clears throat> Um, no, if you give me a little bit more detail on what specifically you're talking about, I'll be happy to take a look and give you a little bit more of my perspective on it. Atrial fib is a huge topic. It's, it's got what appeared to be outdated associations with alcohol, for example, and at the end of the day, uh, it turns out that uh, they thought al the alcohol association was outdated. And more, much more recent evidence would indicate, no, it's not outdated. Um, Omega-3s have some blood thinner components to them. 
And so a lot of people might consider them for atrial fib because of its uh, increased risk for stroke, five to eight times the uh, risk of stroke than someone who doesn't have it. So, you know, part of the concern, part of the question that road goggles is bringing up is, is part of the treatment and that's in omega threes are not a great treatment for um, stroke risk, but be that as, as it may is part of the, the treatment associated or part of the cure associated with uh, the risk. Millard Woods. Good morning. Millard, sometime you're going to have to tell me whether or not it's Millard or Millard. Millard. I keep wanting to say Millard, but good morning either way. Harvey Ops, don't forget to like or click like or thumbs up. Yes, and uh, Aspen's got a super chat there. Um, if you would like to help us get this information out to save more lives, just click a super chat. And obviously it's, you know, uh, you might say, well, it's five bucks. Well, five bucks is a is a big deal. Five bucks American is a big deal for a, a lot of our staff, for example, in the Philippines and, uh, and Mexico who help us create this content and uh, get it out there. Um, and clicking a like button or a thumbs up button doesn't cost anything. So, yes, if you'll... If you'll do that, that would be helpful. Even more effective is what Aspen just put up there. He said, like us on Facebook. So if you go into one of the other media outlets like Facebook or Twitter and you put our stuff and somebody actually comes back from one of those other groups to YouTube or Facebook to look at these uh, videos, then that's like a super bonus for the AI. They say, look, other humans are looking at this and it was important enough to where it pulled eyeballs away from a competitor media to this, this media. So it'll really help push that information out. Thank you, R Harvey, for the reminder. It was an excellent point. And Bobby's talking to JMK again. Other cardiovascular inflama inflammatory tests that I'm recommending uh, Bart Robinson, yes, pound that like button. Thank you so much, Bart. I appreciate that. Um, Bobby Ocampo, the problem with the endocrinologist guidelines want us to maintain diabetic. They say that maintaining a 7% hemoglobin A1C is enough. Something is really wrong with the guidelines. Bobby's got a really good point. Bobby, I think, is a healthcare provider in the Philippines. And sure enough, um, it's a weird group, and our, our group is considered weird within the medical channels in terms of managing diabetes because we think seven is just really bad. I've got tons of diabetics in our practice, and, you know, people that when you challenge them, their blood sugars go up to 300, 350, 400, significant diabetes. Uh, I had a very young man come to us once who had... Uh, gosh, a year before seeing us, he had just totally rebelled against his diabetes care, felt like I'm a young person. This shouldn't happen to me. I'm going to ignore it. A1C got up to 14. He ended up having some very serious uh, problems that required skin grafting and hospitalization. But the bottom line is uh, even the AACE, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, the American uh, Endocrinology Bo um, um, Conferences Standards Committees often recommend this level. And one of the reasons why is the previous medications that these levels were based on. If you got lower than, than, a, uh, than an A1C of seven, and especially for the older diabetics in the 70s and 80s to use the medications like insulin to get that low, you ran danger of hypoglycemia and death associated with hypoglycemia. Well, I would say using insulin, eating a ton of carbs and using insulin to manage your diabetes is like, it's incredibly old school, it's incredibly dangerous, and that is what led to these standards committees recommending an A1C of 7.0.
like I said, I've got very significant uh, patients with very significant diabetes, many of whom control their A1Cs like down into the fives and even below doing it with lifestyle alone. Now, I don't really recommend that. I think metformin and the new diabetes drugs that we talked about, the GLP ones and the the SGLT2s, and even before that, pioglitazone, the thialazine uh, diazides, those, you know, which are getting passe at this point because of the risk benefit. But even those uh, were big helps to people that had very significant uh, diabetes. Um, Harvey Ops, any possible connection between the higher HDL levels and better blood pressure? Yes, no question. A lipidologist describing some actions of HDL implied benefit in the thelium and nitric oxide release. HDL takes hard work. Yeah, so that's very true. And if you look at, you're bringing up a really good point, Harvey. Uh, so for example, quite often with people like myself, the first thing you start seeing in, in middle age in terms of the chronic diseases is increasing blood pressure. Well, <clears throat> uh, my personal belief and a lot of the evidence would indicate that that still wasn't the original problem. The original problem was... Um, increasing insulin resistance. Why would increasing insulin resistance cause uh, high blood pressure? Um, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the term. Uh, the term is a generic chemical term for uh, glucose that has been, uh, that has bonded to protein. And where do you see that in the outside world? You see that on in barbecue. Where do you see that internally? Hemoglobin A1C. In other words, if your blood sugar starts uh, raising, increasing a little bit, um, you start getting uh, in A1C, which is glucose that has bound covalently if you're a chemist, but it's a strong permanent bind if you're not a chemist to a protein. Most common one, again, in our body is hemoglobin A1C, and that tends to clog up the uh, what, what's called the baroreceptors in the kidney, uh, making the kidney think that it's not getting enough pressure and therefore increasing the pressure, which is blood pressure. So why would, so where I'm going with this is, you know, I didn't even get into the association of HDL. Let me just go ahead and do that really quickly um, to the point about how all of this, all of these, almost all of these chronic diseases really tend to be related. One of the most important things that I can do with an evaluation of somebody for their chronic disease metabolism is to do what's called a fractionation. Now it's a lipid fractionation. It's looking at, um, HDL actual components and LDL actual components. I've done video on this. It was a couple of years ago where we actually went into the, the bell curves of an HDL uh, population and the bell curve of an LDL population. Now, why were those important? Glucose, not cholesterol, glucose. So when, you're ha when you have carb metabolism problems, what tends to happen is um, the larger, fluffier particles, whether it's HDL particles on the one hand or LDL particles, either one, the larger, fluffier particles tend to change. Instead of having carrying cholesterol, they tend to carry fatty acids. Now, fatty acids... Uh, fatty acid laden particles when they're carried through the liver um, tend to get metabolized. So, you know what? We always thought that small, dense LDL were a bad thing, that they did damage. And we always thought that low HDL meant that um, 
you didn't have protection uh, that a that a high HDL would happen. Go back and look at the HDL particles in the labs and look at my video. I actually, again, our lab, uh, the lab that our lab is, we don't own any, own any labs, um, never would, they're a disaster. But the lab that we use most often, uh, uh, Quest, used to provide us a great bell curve. And you can see it when the carb metabolism is uh, changed, you get this big shark bite visually it looks like a shark bite out of the bell curve for hdl the large fluffy hdl are lost the whole the l the ldl curve reacts differently it just the whole thing shifts to the small end the, to the left and you can get some skew but again th the point is think about it is it that HDL is protecting us? Is it that small dense LDL is damaging us? Or is it that the that these are biomarkers telling us that we've lost our large fluffy HDL, we've lost our large fluffy LDL, and we've lost it because of a damaged carb metabolism? Great question. I hope that ended up answering your question, Harvey, because you started talking about endothelium and nitric oxide, and I'm not going to take the time to go down the bunny hole of talking about the health connections, the metabolic connections between uh, carb metabolism and endothelium and nitric oxide. Old Roscoe, this morning on ABC News, there was a short story about about avoiding excess sugar for heart disease prevention. Maybe the word is getting out. Wouldn't that be nice? I think it is. Uh, unfortunately, uh, healthcare is a very, very big ship and it takes a long time to turn it. Ora Ruth Kamieni, Shalom Doc Mayo Buntag. Thank you. Shalom to you as well. <clears throat> And hello. Bobby Ocampo, please have your courses approved with continuing education uh, points for the MD in the US so it can be easily approved in the Philippines. Bobby, I, I, bottom line, we used to do that. And, you know, we talked about the juice wasn't worth the squeeze, the benefit wasn't worth the risk. You know, unfortunately, uh, the, the, uh, the learning centers that are able to do C award CMEs for this and that will just aren't worth it these days. They see it as a major force, a major source of income. And, you know, I know this, I used to do this for Hopkins and at Hopkins, we were very, very particular and picky about who we uh, agreed to award CMEs, what, what courses we agreed to award CMEs for. And it was, that's what we did for a living. So it was going to be our folks. Um, back when I was at uh, Physician Partners, we looked at some groups that would do it. It's usually smaller groups. And again, they usually see it as a source of income. And like I said, for guys that, pre that create this, it just hasn't been worth it in a couple of decades, really. Hope prevention medicine, preventive medicine will be considered one of the specializations in medicine like cardiology, endocrinology, et cetera. It is. It has been for many years. It started off mostly in uh, public health in the U.S. Um, I am preventive medicine board certified. I actually sat with the preventive medicine board a few times. I provided as in my role as the chief of preventive medicine for Johns Hopkins, I provided a lot of consultation to the uh, American Board of Preventive Medicine, ABPM. Had a lot of friends on the board, had a lot of, uh, actually a couple of my uh, trainees went on to sit on the board. Mike Parkinson um, is a past president of that. He was my chief resident at one of the years that I was running the program. Um, Miriam Alexander, a past president of the American Board of Preventive Medicine. Uh, she was one of my chief residents as well. Both very, very good docs, uh, very, very talented. 
Um, one of the things that I'm doing now, there, there has been a little bit of a food fight and competition among different boards for lifestyle medicine. There's a quote, American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, the American Board of Pre Preventive Medicine has claimed that other groups have tried to claim it. Um, other groups have gotten into that battle. Um, not going <laughs> to not going to say much else other than there's a lot of poli academic poli politics involved. Bobby Ocampo, I take SGLT2 and metformin on my first day of 72 hours fasting. Uh, you're not unusual, especially as people get accustomed to these meds. Um, and again, there's very little risk of uh, uh, after your body gets accustomed to these meds, SGLT2s and metformin. Uh, ha do have minimal risk. It's not like taking uh, insulin. So you wouldn't want to take, for example, insulin on your first day of a 72-hour fast. Ibrahim Ali, good day. May you consider what is called metabolic syndrome in your discussion together with insulin resistance for both VLDL and inflammation? I do, Ibrahim. Thank you so much for asking the question. And um I've been talking a little bit fast today, but I did mention it early on in the introduction that metabolic syndrome is just another word. I mean, a syndrome is sort of like a panel. Lab panels happen when there's no one good lab test that tells you the whole story. A syndrome is a constellation of signs and symptoms. Those happen when there's no good single description for what happened. And metabolic syndrome, it, it was far more popular in the past. It's your, uh, your abdomen's too large, you uh, weigh too much, you have high blood pressure, you have, um, oh gosh, I forgot what some of the, oh, high LDLs. You know, it's a constellation of signs and symptoms, which boil down and mean you've got insulin resistance. So, now that we've gotten a lot clearer on what actually drives the underlying core issue for metabolic syndrome, and by the way, metabolic syndrome was recognized early on as being a major risk for heart attack and stroke. Um, once we've found out that there's a core metabolic process here and it's insulin resistance, then you tend to not see that term so much anymore, but Yes, metabolic syndrome. That's exactly what it is. Thank you, Ibrahim. Millard Wood, Millard Woods, how about if we cardio patients were to share names of docs in our state who followed the Brewer protocol? The docs are taking a long time to self-identify. Well, that would be fine with me. And again, you can share that with us if you want. You can, um, I think it does help. We, you need more. You need more resources out there for what we do. Um, Leo Acapulco, good morning, Doctor B. Is there a way to wane wane GLP one if we only want to lose a few pounds and need? Oh, so I, I think the question uh, that Leo's probably bringing up is, um, can you? take the GLP-1 for a while and then come off of it. Classically, what you hear is that that doesn't work, you, that you can't take it short term, lose a few pounds and then go off of it. The reality is I've seen plenty of people make it work very well, uh, myself included. Um, it, it, it It's classically used as a long-term medication, but it can also help you change your habits. There is absolutely no question that our hormones, the GLP hormones, glucagon-like peptides, like glucagon, vary significantly in us. And it's a major help for us to make some of the changes that many of us need to make in terms of our diet, lifestyle, most specifically diet, as you know, or maybe you don't know, but you can, you cannot outrun, you cannot out-exercise a diet problem. So diet is the most important. 
And yes, I've seen plenty of people do exactly what you're not supposed to be able to do, and that is use glip ones to make some changes and then not use glip ones long term. And yes, insulin resistance is one of those uh, one of those issues. Bobby Ocampo, first things first, low carb is uh, as low as possible and walk away after every meal. We cannot out medicate a bad diet. You know, it's a very good point. Our minds are thinking alike, Bobby, today. Um, you can't outrun a bad diet and you can't out medicate a bad diet. I've had too many people with continuing weight problems come to see me uh, again, with continuing weight problems, despite the fact that they were on GLIP ones for two years. Uh, Bobby Ocampo's fractionation test shows um, pattern A, even LDL is very high. So you get that a lot. You get that a lot with um, high LDL patterns, but still, um, or high LDL, but still a, a pattern A. Pattern A is a healthy pattern. What it means is that you don't have that skew. You don't have that loss of the large, fluffy, healthy LDLs. And yes, I see that a lot, Bobby. Um, oh, it, these fractionations come in every different size and flavor. Can C-peptide indicate insulin resistance? I, I don't really use it that much. I have, I've had a couple of docs that taught me, took me to school on C-peptide. C-peptide is the other part of the, for those of you who don't know, C-peptide is the other part of the protein. You know, there are several proteins, for example, uh, haptoglobin, the pre-lysis uh, form of, hap of uh, uh, haptoglobin is zonulin. That may go over a lot of people's head. I'm not going to go down that bunny hole, but the body tends to make a protein is a long chain or multiple long chains of amino acids. And um, the um, body often has to cut pieces of that long chain out in order for it to work. And that the part that gets cut out is called C peptide. Mm. Well, we've got D Taylor as a new member. I'm going to have to skip down because we're getting a lot of, um, we're not going to be able, <clears throat> I've got a few more minutes. I'm going to have to jump around, skip a little bit. Um, thank you, D, for joining us. And thank you for joining us as a YouTube member. We appreciate that. It helps us get that information out. Um, Thank you so much. There's uh, a, we've got a couple of super chats here. Um, J, J and A, you are the man. Keep it up. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And Rick Willer, $25 super chat. Thank you so much. That'll help us get this out quite a bit. Hi, Dr. Brewer. Rick from Sacramento, California. You're one of the best in my book. Thank you so much, Rick. I appreciate that. Uh, I spent some time in a previous role in Sacramento. I was talking with somebody recently who this person has a horse farm and, you know, they played polo and all that stuff and lots of travel. I'm thinking, wow, I haven't done any, a lot of that stuff. But they said one of their big things was to take a wine tour in Napa Valley. Well, it's interesting because in a previous life, I was with a group uh, that was doing what's called a roll up. We were purchasing a bunch of freestanding existing occupational medicine clinics, preventive clinics, started in California, but uh, went in other areas of the country as well. Uh, I think we bought about five clinics in Sacramento and several in uh, San Francisco. Those of you who are local and know the area know what's between Sacramento and San Francisco, the Napa Valley. So uh, myself and several other uh, leaders in the organization ended up having to take a few weekends 
and it took a long time for us to get f- between San Francisco and Sacramento. We were doing that uh, that wine tour. <clears throat> this past weekend, I just visited an uncle. Uh, his name is Dan Carroll, and he's one of the, uh, I think, he, he he would he would bashfully say, "No, nah, Ford, you're overdoing." It. He's I think he's one of the biggest uh, enologists in the country. You know, he's a, he's on the chemical side, and enology, by the way, is vine the science of vines. He's been a big uh, wine judge all over the country. So he taught me a little bit this weekend, and I thought, hmm, you know, that would be interesting learning to be a uh, an enologist or a wine judge. Not exactly the same thing, but his big thing, he, he taught at uh, NC State and he was deep into the chemicals associated with uh, different tastes of food in general, but wine. Uh, he helped develop the, um, the vineyards at Biltmore Gardens, Biltmore House and Gardens, for those of you who know that space. Anyhow, uh, we, he he taught me some of some stuff this weekend and I, I became very clear very quickly. I could never be a wine judge. It's just too much. <clears throat> Anyhow, I digress. Aura Ruth, Black Oscillation. Thank you, Aura Ruth. You're exactly right. Um, Black Oscillates. There's another term as well, Aura Ruth. Um, Black Oscillated Proteins. Age, that's it. Advanced glycosylation, glyc, uh, glycosylation end products. Age, that was the term that I was looking for. For those of you who didn't get it. So back when we talked about um, the common theory, there's, there's, a, there's a term. It's called the common theory of... Um, chronic disease. And the common theory goes like this. It's saying, look, there's all of these diseases tend to happen at the same time. You know, you get into the 40s and the curve starts going up. It's called the morbidity curve as well as the mortality curve. In other words, morbidity, sickness, mortality is death. We start getting sick and dying uh, in 40s. And then, you know, each decade it goes steeper and steeper. So a lot of people say, well, is there it isn't that brains wear out at or is it that brains wear out as we get older hearts wear out as we get older uh kidneys wear out uh orthopedically we wear out or is there something going on metabolically i think uh many of us myself included and if you read the book you read any of um uh, Walter Longo's stuff, read especially David Sinclair's stuff. They talk about, yeah, there's a common denominator here, and it's called glycosylation, which is associated with prediabetes, which is associated with insulin resistance, which is another term for or mild insulin resistance, quote, mild, which kills more people than severe insulin resistance. It's called metabolic syndrome. You start to hear some things over and over and over again in different variations. And Harvey's right, AGE, advanced glycosylation in products. The most common of which Harvey is hemoglobin A1C. Hemoglobin is a protein and when it gets glycosylated, it tends to, you may remember the other part of the discussion we had. It, how is that metabolically associated with the common disease problem? For example, somebody like me, whose first chronic disease happened to be high blood pressure, AGEs, advanced glycos, easy for me to say, advanced glycosylation end products tend to clog up those baroreceptors or pressure receptors associated with the um, the filter mechanism in the kidney. Raise your pressure, 
which in, in turn is raising your blood pressure. I'm going to have to go. It's been a great uh, session today. I really appreciate all of the interest and great questions we've had. And um, we will see you next week.